So thank you for coming out to our little uh, talk today. We're doing this all week. Uh, on that whiteboard that you cannot see now, I think we have the URL for the rest of our events. We did some. All right, for, for the other ones, do.co forward slash Berlin. And as I like to say, I said this last night, we are so happy about opening a Frankfurt Data Center. We came to Berlin. And we just went to, and <laughs> <laughs> it took a while for it. <laughs> we weren't paying attention. Yeah, so no, it's, um, so we, we are here, we're here in Germany this week, and we're, we're opening up a, a data center in Frankfurt very, very soon now. Why Frankfurt? Yeah. Um, Frankfurt actually has great internet. Uh, where we've moved to in Frankfurt is in a large data center park that is made for data centers. We are peering, um, we have all the big peers, but um, we are not exactly co-located, but we're co-located with Microsoft and Amazon and Google. I mean, this, it's, a, it's actually a great place for bandwidth. And out of all of our facilities, from at least from our networking guys, they said this is their favorite one. It's, it's good here in Germany. So Berlin needs to step it up a little bit, and maybe next time we can move it here. But um, it's still good. Um, we're all about making sure that anyone who wants to use our service has at least the closest service they can. And we know we had Amsterdam. We have a few data centers in Amsterdam, and we've done that for a few years. But um, actually, and I understand that the German privacy laws are, are pretty crazy, and crazy in a good way about protecting people's data, and actually having a data center where um, you can have data here in Germany, and it's not going anywhere else, and it's all safe harbor approved and all this good stuff um, is a good thing. And another good thing is that um, unlike a lot of other cloud providers, and this is not a negative, this is just something we do, we don't have a lot of peering between all of our sites. So um, in a lot of cases, we don't use a lot of private backend networks. Uh, we are not a big player. We are, we're DigitalOcean. We are the third largest web host in the world, but we're not, we don't, we are, we're not, a huge player in this game and we don't have unlimited resources. So what we do is we rely on everyone we peer with to get our traffic back and forth and come to find out it works very, very well. And it saves, on, it saves us costs that we can pass on to you. Um, $5 droplets, $5 droplets, but don't use those, use the $10 droplets, they're better. <laughs> so, um, and not just because it gives us more money, I'm just saying I know things and they are better. So you definitely use the $10 droplets. It's much better value for your dollar, or your euro in this case. Is that what you guys spend here, euros? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought it was Monopoly money. I got a whole pocket full of Monopoly money right now. Pretty much. Oh, it's awesome for Americans. So, on to the real topic at hand is developing Rails apps, Rails apps in Docker. And I want to just talk about right now, we're not going to do much developing Rails apps. As a matter of fact, I have not done a lot of small app development in Rails for quite a while. So I went and found a Rails app on the internet to use the demo app. And the cool thing about this is because I was able to do this relatively quickly, it means that everything that I'm talking about, for the most part, should be able to apply to everything that you're doing. And it's not anything specific to DigitalOcean or anything else. It's just Rails on Docker. And what I want, and the goals here, um, I'll tell you after I tell you who I am. Last night I didn't have a slide with my name on it. Um, I'm Brian Lyles. I, I am a cloud engineer. That's not on my card. That's my title. I think cloud engineer sounds neat because you could say, what does a cloud engineer do? Well, anything you want me to do. But um, I work on not quite the front end and not quite the back end. Um, I do things in the middle. But it's very important stuff nonetheless. Um, and I'm here on Twitter. And the most important one is DigitalOcean on Twitter. Um, we actually have a very cool Twitter feed. Our community group, led by Fine Intel over here, uh, they're very, very, very good at Twitter. Um, I, I will give them that. They're good at Twitter, a lot better than I am. So on to the real stuff. Um, an introduction, and I put up an agenda. I will try to stick to this, but I probably will not. But I want to say that we're going to talk about getting started, just to get everybody on the same playing field. Um, then we'll talk about running with Docker. And then we'll talk about managing dependencies in Docker. And because this is a good thing, this is a small crowd, um, anytime you have a question, please stop me. We can talk about it. And, and we can talk it through. I mean, I won't give you um, money consulting advice, but I'll, I'll show you where you can go, look. And then I'll talk about developing in Docker, using Docker as part of your development stack. And then we'll talk about automation just a little bit. And then I have a, I have a list of other thoughts. 
Um, if this was a real workshop where I had you guys with laptops, um, we would actually go into these other thoughts, but there's a couple issues. Um, who here has used Docker in any capacity? All right, so these four hands, including mine, that are up, know that if you have a Docker with a large image and you do a Docker pool, what happens? You sit and you wait. So I didn't want to have a whole workshop of sitting and waiting. So I've done my best to make sure that all my dependencies are, are pretty local and we shouldn't have to download a whole bunch of things. And, and I just hope that you guys get something out of this. So let's talk about how we're going to start this off. Um, welcome. This is the Docker on Rails talk. All right, we just started, so you haven't missed anything. So um, I want to get everyone with Docker. You can go to docker.com and you can download Docker. And, but the problem is, is that if you're not running Linux, um, it's not going to work very well for you because unfortunately, Docker is containers and Linux using LXC. And if you're using a Mac, like a lot of us developers use Macs, um, LXC doesn't work very well. Actually, it doesn't really work at all. So um, Docker has come up with a great solution called Docker Machine. And the cool thing about Docker Machine is it's based on something called Boot to Docker. So for a year now, we've been using Boot to Docker. And what it does is it will actually boot a virtual box, virtual machine on your, on your, on your system with a very small operating system. And it'll configure Docker. And with the Docker client, you can actually set the Docker host. And if you point the Docker host to your virtual machine, you can just use Docker like it's local. Only problem is, is that if you map ports to localhost, it's the local host of your virtual machine. So but we'll talk about how to get that out. So this is a little spiel about Docker machine. Um, the most important part is this note. Uh, machine is currently in beta. And you don't have to re read anything else on there. And what I'm telling you now to get started is that experiment with Docker in development and staging and experiment with Docker in production. But remember, you are only experimenting. Um, Docker has not really given us a great set of guarantees on any of these tools that they're published lately. So use them. They do work for the most part. I'll show you some little bugs, because there are bugs on my machine. But use them, but understand that you cannot let your stack rely on all these tools. But while you're, you spend most of your time developing and testing, you can use these tools in development and test. So one more time, this is a lot of beta stuff, but it's still very cool nonetheless. So what does Docker management look like? What does Docker machine bring that Docker or boot to Docker doesn't have? Well, the one thing is if you use boot to Docker, you got one host. You could do boot to Docker up or boot to Docker init, and you would get one host. The cool thing about um, boot or Docker machine is that it allows you to have multiple hosts. And you'll notice that in my listing here, that I have a mix of VirtualBox and DigitalOcean. Uh, they support us out of the box. They use drivers that we wrote. So for the most part, if you boot, um, if you boot some, uh, a Docker machine instance using DigitalOcean, you're actually using code that we wrote. And we pretty much know that it works. And another neat thing is that you don't have to worry about all your different environments. You notice here that besides the Berlin ones, that I created those to support some of this talk and other talks, um, I have something called Atlantis, which is a piece of software that we use internally. Um, we're really big on um, C names at DigitalOcean. We have like a conference room called Coral Reef and Sammy, and Sammy is this, by the way. That's the name of our, our little mascot. So we're big on this. I don't, Atlantis is a cool name. Everyone knows it, everyone uses it. It's, it's the internal meeting point for everything DigitalOcean. And you'll notice that I also, I happen to be on the billing project. Um, I keep them all separate. So billing, and then we have another core Ruby project. Um, and you'll notice they're all differently. But I also have a dev as well. And I just do random dev things in there. But the cool thing is I can have separation of my environments. And it's so cheap. And I'll show you this in right now, actually. It's so cheap. No. It's so cheap that. I can actually, we'll do it in this terminal, I can do DM. Um, normally the tool is called docker-machine, but docker-machine is pretty long to type. So I aliased it, just if anyone is concerned, uh, alias DM. It's just an alias for docker machine. So anytime you see me typing DM, it's just docker machine. So what I can do is D, DM, so let me just, there we go. 
So what I'm creating now is a local, uh, a local um, Docker machine. And it's just booting VirtualBox. And everybody's computers have lots of memory nowadays. You saw how many I have running right now. Um, this is just another one. When it's not using the memory, it's not using the memory, so it's not a big deal. One other neat thing is that you can configure the memory, you can configure the amount of CPUs, so it kind of looks like your machine. And as soon as this thing starts up, I'll show you another neat feature. And this is very important to running Rails or developing Rails applications using Docker machine. So, I don't have this part down to a science. I don't know that it takes exactly 35 seconds for this to start up. But there you go. So what I'm doing now is, because I have a whole bunch of different Docker machine environments, I have to actually configure uh, the, the current environment for this particular machine. So what, they give you a command called env, and if you give it, actually I'll show you this way. So dm env hello-world. And what it does is it gives you three environment variables, and it just tells you to verify TLS that sometimes works, they're fixing this. Um, it tells you to do the cert path, and it just tells what the cert is when we're talking to Docker, and it tells you to the host. And what I can do by wrapping it with the dollar sign in parentheses, I'm basically just sourcing it into my environment, so now it's part. So whenever I do Docker PS, this Docker command is actually going to this virtual machine. So you'll notice that I have other ones, like is in my listing, and it's even in it, it's the same type of thing, so whenever, I'll show you, I'll move this up to the top in a second, but if I look, go to berlin-do-dev, because I know that one's on DigitalOcean, um, if I echo my Docker host, it's actually, um, it's actually out on a DigitalOcean droplet. And the neat thing about this is that soon, this week, you guys will be able to do this as well because I happen to know that this IP right here is in Frankfurt. So we do have the compute capacity out there. We're very close to opening it. So moving on. So, so whenever you have Rails apps, most Rails apps have databases. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, in this talk, I'm only gonna talk about Postgres. Um, you might be using MongoDB or MySQL or you might be using Redis or RethinkDB or something else as a database. Um, I could spend all day talking about different databases, but we're gonna pick one. In this case, we're gonna pick Postgres. Uh, most, many rail shops use Postgres. Any rail shops here who don't use Postgres? Notice my hand is raised. We don't use Postgres. <laughs> use MySQL? Yeah. All right, we use MySQL at DigitalOcean. And you know, we use it, it's a, it's a I say it's legacy, but it's not bad legacy. We just use it because that's what we use when we start at the first application. We don't use it for any other particular reason. Um, there's a lot of neat things in Postgres that I'm sure you guys are taking advantage of, like real subselects, um, real materialized views, things like that. Um, so I'm jealous of you for being able to use this, so we'll talk about this one today. So before we get into our, um, our Postgres app, let's, let's actually look at our Rails app. So I actually did download a Rails app, and I de-trademarked it. I don't think I need to put the trademark up. I'm not really sharing it. I just took off the other trademark. Um, this, this app right here is just a Rails app. It's a to-do app. And because, um, I'll go to my editor. Is this big enough for you guys? Um, you'll notice that in my configuration, it's configured as Postgres. So one thing I haven't said is that I'm not running Postgres. And the real reason I came to look at Docker in the first place is that in any particular day, I might work on a couple different apps that have a couple different backends, whether they be Redis or Postgres or, some, or Redis or MySQL or something else. And what always bothered me is that I would come to, I would have this Redis instance that I pumped full of bad data, and then I hooked up another one, and I didn't namespace the first one or I had two versions of the same app because we're getting ready to release a new release of something, and I don't want to put it on the old one because it potentially might change or corrupt the data in a way that I can't account for that we'll never see in production. So the real thing that we're looking for is a way to have a development environment that works with us. I want to be able to launch my database and whatever other NoSQL stores that I have, but I want to make sure that they're only here for this app. And when I launch another instance of this application or another application, I want to make sure that 
that is totally segregated and I can find everything and I don't want to have a whole bunch of scripts and all that to map with them. So um, what can we do? Well, the first thing we can do is let's look at our instances again. Um, we're, in this case, we're going to use a local one. Um, I have this Berlin dev one. I think it has all the good stuff downloaded. And like I was talking about, I was downloading this at the hotel earlier and it, I was getting 4.8 megabits per second and it was a 350 megabyte file. So you can see how long that would take. So it took a good hour to download it. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start up Postgres inside of Docker. So this is actually pretty simple. It's for people who are actually for most of the people in this room who have never seen Docker, this is how it works. Um, Docker has a command. Uh, let me um, source my environment to make sure we're using the right one. Um, Berlin-dev. So I've configured myself to talk to this Docker server. There's nothing running on it. So now I'm going to run Docker and I'm going to tell it to run. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just run it normally. So I have this image called Postgres and I'll show you where that comes from. And that's it. And what it did in this case is it actually ran Postgres. It's running in my virtual machine and it streamed uh, standard out to my screen. Crappy part about this is that, yeah, um, now I can't do anything. I mean, I could launch another TMUX session, but we can do better than that. So instead of doing it just that way, and actually I just control C'd out of it. So I just quit it and it doesn't really matter. It's in a container that I'll never ever use again. I'm gonna make a new one. And all, my, all I'm gonna do is give it a dash D. And that dash D says, make it as a daemon. So it goes off in the background. And then what I'm also going to do is tell it to uh, map the ports to 5432 to localhost 5432. Because, because Docker is a container, it actually manages its own ports. So if you don't tell it what, where to put these ports, it'll just not put the ports. So you will not be able to get to your server at all. So in this case, I said dash P 5432 is basically saying make local host 5432 match to the containers 5432. And I get this long, um, this is the actual ID of, of that container. And if I do uh, Docker PS, you'll be able to see that's the beginning of it. Um, this is still not good enough. So let's, let's get rid of this. Nope, I did it wrong. There we go. Um, we can do better than this. So what we're going to do now is we're actually going to name it. And we'll just name it DB. It's, this is a weird, um, this is the weirdest thing in Docker. Docker's a Go app. And they wanted to, so with Go app, with Go, there's, there's a package in the standard library called flags, and it wants single dashes. But Docker people were saying, no, we don't like single dashes. We want double dashes. And now you see how the tables have turned. And they basically totally eschewed um, the Go conventions. And now we're just going to use double. So I feel like they're making fun of us now. So if I do Docker PS, you'll notice that um, it's still the same. I still have the same ID here. I have an, a new ID, but now my, um, my container is named DB. So I can at least. Um, I can at least uh, specify it by name rather than that crazy ID. So because it's running now, all I need to do here is, is go back to my Rails app and I have it configured. All I'm going to do is set an environment variable. This one, this db underscore port underscore 5432 underscore tcp underscore adder. I'm going to set that to the IP address of my Docker container. And I'll, take, and I'll show you in a while why I use this funky format. It's a Dockerism. But um, for going through this demo, it's actually not too bad. So we'll just do this. And we'll go DM IP Berlin dash dev. And a neat thing I did not show you is that Berlin dash, you can actually get the IP of all your containers. So even if I had one that was not local that was actually out on the internet, we can get that. So now that we have this, guess what we can do? We can just go Rails C. No, not Rails C. Let's go Rails S. We'll start a server. And because I have a server, and I think I actually might even have some data in there, if I go to localhost, uh-oh, let me see something here. Oh, I deleted everything. 
You guys didn't tell me that when I created my new database, I did not create the actual data. I didn't create my, my data. So you guys are not paying attention. This is a group effort here. So we'll do wake db create db setup. Familiar? Everybody familiar with Rails? There you go. So what this is doing is going in, creating tables, and inserting some stuff. So now when I run the Rails app, there we go. It'll be happy. So if I go localhost 3000, there we go. And we have this app. To-do app, you can actually create some tasks, a new task, um, and then another task. Like I said, the app is not important. All we want to see is that we can use it, put stuff in the database, and we read stuff in the database back. But you know, that's, so I can end the talk right now. Look, Docker, Rails, Postgres, Docker, Rails, right? That's, that's what we have here. We're running Docker and Rails, but you know, we can do a lot better than this. And now, let me go back to my slides. So we looked at our Rails app, but now we want to look at running Rails in Docker. And that's really what we want to get to, is how do we actually move a Rails app to Docker, and what kind of funky things do we need to do? So the first thing we might need is a Docker file. And I don't expect anyone here to know what a Docker file is, and actually tell you the truth, the format of the file is not very important. But what a Docker file is, is a description for Docker to build an image. And I didn't go really into how much how Docker works. So Docker really is a layered file system type thing. And what it does, and I'll show you this in the file, and it'll make a lot of sense. So imagine the, the, the lines in this file are not important. Just know that we go from top to bottom. So each line is a different instruction. And what happens is, so this first line just happens to be from. So it's saying, take this other image and put that as your first layer. And then what we're going to do is run this app get, and you're going to layer that right across the top of the file system. There will be some changes, but everything else is there. Just keep it there. And we'll just move from the top of the file down to the bottom of the file, all the way down to the bottom where we add our Rails app to the Docker container. So what we're doing is we're layering up a new image, and then what we'll do, Docker will smash that down into a tar file, and they'll send it off to a server. And then when Docker needs to build a container, they'll just take that whole smash thing and read it back. So what we have here is um, as a description for doing Rails. And let me get rid of that. So I will go through these lines for you. So um, I have this image, and this is a public image. I will tell you, if you are going to think about using Docker in production or stage or development, um, take the public images as gospel, but do not use them. Actually, if, if you find one that you like, fork it to your GitHub or if you're not using GitHub or you're using GitHub Enterprise, fork it to your internal GitHub, manage your own Docker files. Because the problem is, is that, um, yeah, they do have version numbers on them, but Docker has not given us any guarantee that this stuff will never change or actually just be there forever. So if you find something good, it's like having, if you use Chef or if you use Puppet, because I know someone said they're using Puppet. If you haven't find good Puppet scripts or good Chef recipes, keep those local to yourself. So in this case, I'm actually using a public one called Ruby 2.2.0. And all it does is it creates a base operating system. I think it's Ubuntu in this case. And on top of it, it has Ruby layered. And the cool thing about that is it means I now don't have to use anything like RBM or RVM or have to manage any types of Ruby. Ruby will be on this machine. And then, yeah, I know it is an Ubuntu or Debian because we're, doing app, we're updating it. We're updating it to the newest version. We're just installing everything. Or we're updating the, the file repo, or the, the repo for um, Deb, and then we're installing Build Essential. And we're only installing that because we really want a C and a C++ compiler. And then you'll notice that um, we are doing app get install again on the next line, and we're creating a new layer. But the reason we're doing it this way is so that we can keep our Postgres dependency um, different from our our um, build essential. We're assuming that our Postgres dependency can actually change more often than build essential. And, and if that's the case, it won't actually rebuild the, the first line. It'll actually just go down to this line and, and build from this down. And then this next thing is this for Nokogiri. Um, so XML, XSLT. And then what we're doing is we're setting up where our app is. Because we have our own container, we can, we can put our app where we want. Um, I have this convention where I create slash app in my app name. Some people put the apps right off the root directory. It doesn't matter. It's your file, it's your file system you don't share with anyone else. And I'm making the directory. 
and then I'm setting the work directory to app to do. And the reason why is because whenever we log into or boot this container, we want to make sure that we're in this directory. So whenever this comes up, we'll be in app to do. And then I'm adding a gem file and the gem file lock. And, and then I'm running bundle install, and you'll see why we have to do this in a second. Well, of course, you know why we have to do this. You have to run bundler. If not, you won't have any your gems. Um, and then what we're doing is we are, um, this is just a little catch here on this line 18, is to make sure if I'm running this app in a whole bunch of different locations, or if I was running it locally and then tried to make a Docker image out of it, that I don't have a server PID. Rails gets up, we're using um, Puma in this case. I think this app uses Puma. Um, in this case, and if that server PID is up, the Rails app just won't boot. It'll actually complain. And then notice that I have to make sure the line ended with something true. Um, if you remove a file that doesn't exist, it returns a one, and it would actually stop the Docker file from building. And then what I'm doing now is I'm taking, I'm saying, say, take this current directory that this file is in, and then add it into the container. So really, we're copying the whole app into con this container. So let's go ahead and kill this, and I'll show you how that works. So we can do docker build, um, and we're going to tag it. We're going to give it a name. Um, in this case, I'll give it to do one, and we're saying the docker file is in this directory. So what it's doing now is this is about a 65 or 67 meg of stuff. It'll actually just take all this stuff, and it's copying it over to the virtual machine, and it's done. <clears throat> But um, what's, what, it's did, what it did here is it actually packaged this up, created an image of your whole Rails app. So you know what? Since we have an image, and if I look at my Docker images, um, you notice I have this to-do one. Um, let's boot it. So let's look at this, see what we have running already. So we have our, we have our um, database running. So we can go Docker run, and we'll let this run in the foreground for right now. And we'll, um, we'll just run it. I called it to do one. Um, so the problem is, is that there's no database local. So you have to tell it where, where is this going to get its database from. Docker has this neat convention where you can link, you can link um, containers to another container. So I can say that all the ports in my database container make them available in my, in my to do one container. So that's what I'm typing here. So I'm saying link db as the name db. And if you remember earlier where I said in my, in my um, config .data, my database.yaml file where I had that funky name, remember that because this is going to be very important here. Ooh. Oh, I'm sorry. It's dash link. It's not dash l. Oh, no. Let me see what I did here. Switch to an, oh. So here's another problem that I, that I had. In my Docker file, notice that I didn't, give it, um, I didn't give it a command to run. So what's happening is we basically exec the shell, and it's, ex it's inspecting input, but there's nothing to give it input. So you, that's why it's complaining that switch to inspect mode. So if I do this, if I show you this thing in inspect mode, um, oops, put these in the wrong place. We get a, we basically, it boots Rails. It boots the console. And I can prove that it boots the console. Oh, I don't actually know what the, I didn't look inside the Rails app. So um, if I knew what the models were in the Rails app, we could actually, let's do that real quick. It's all about doing it live, right? So we have, oh, it is, there is one called task. Oh, you know what it did? It just booted IRB, but it didn't boot the Rails app. So. That's what, the, um, that's what that Ruby 2.2.0 does. It has a command that boots IRB. But you know, we can do better than that. What we really want to do is run bin rails. And we want to, I'm going to cheat. I can remember a lot of things, but I should not have to remember all the things. Um, it's port. So we're going to say that it's port. Um, 3000, and then what we're going to do is set the binding. Yeah, we're going to set the binding to all the interfaces. And really, what this is doing is saying, please start. Uh oh, bin rails. Oh, I know. It's right here. Yes. 
So what we're saying now is run on Rails, run on port 3000 on all the interfaces. So if we go to our web browser and we know the name of this, we know the IP of this host, we should, we should get this um, website to come up. So let's try it. Um, does anybody remember what that IP was? You don't have to, I'm just kidding. So let's look at, um, let's see how we would figure that out. So remember we can do, we can do this and we can go DMIP Berlin dash dev and it's 192.168.99.100 and I try to go there and I can't go there. Do you know why? I, I, huh? The phone is not found, it's local. Right, because remember earlier when I was talking about the databases, I said you have to expose the port? We didn't expose the port. We, expo we told the app where to run, but we didn't tell the serve, we didn't tell Docker to put it on a port. So you notice that this is very cumbersome, right? So what I'm doing is saying, hey, this container exposes port 3000. Take that port 3000 and put it on your port 3000. That's what's happening here. And it's running the app again. It doesn't look any different, but you now notice if I go to the web app, it's the same web app using the same database, but now the Rails app's in Docker. Hey, you know what, that's progress. We could actually end the talk right here and that would be success, right? But not really, because this is not developing apps, apps on, Rails, on Docker. This is actually just deploying an app to Docker. Um, what, what we really want is to be able to do something like this. I wanna be able to go to my layout. No, we'll go to application.html. And I want to be able to go to this title Let's see where, where this title is. Um, let's see, there's a title, here it is, Getting Things Done. And I wanna change it to, I'm getting things done. I wanna have this go in real time. I want my container running and I want my database, but I also wanna be able to edit the app as well. So if I edit this and I save this file and I go back here, guess what, it doesn't work. So really what happened here is that we actually packaged our Rails app inside of the Docker container, but we can't change it. So, but this is a solved problem. There's an actually an easy way to get around this. Docker also allows you to mount volumes. You can actually mount volumes from other containers. So if you, so here's why you'd want to do this. If you have a database running in Docker, this is a scary thing. So you have a container with a database with files and they get written, how do you back up your database? I don't know. So what you can do is Docker prescribes that you could actually create a, a data volume container and then you create your actual database container. You link the data volume container to the data container, and at least you know that if you upgrade your database, your files are safe. And if you ever need to get that out of there, you could just mount that volume and call, copy the files out. We can take advantage of that, and what we can do is we can mount our local machine. We can mount our Mac or your, or your Linux, and this actually probably works on Windows too. You can, you can um, mount your local file system to your Docker container that's actually running in a virtual machine somewhere else. This is magic to me. So um, Docker run has a V parameter. And what I'm going to do is say, take, this, um, take um, my current working directory, and I want to mount it to app slash to do. So wherever I think my Rails app is running, I want to mount it to there. And the reason this works is because boot to Docker has the concept of being able to mount your home directory um, inside of the Docker container. So, so if I go dm ssh to berlin dash dev and I do a df, you'll notice, let me grab user. You notice that user is mounted through VirtualBox. So my home directory is actually, actually all the home directories are here. So if I do this now, um, now I'm running the Rails app inside of Docker using a Dockerized database container, but I'm using, the, I'm using my local file system. So let's see what happens now when we go to the app. So you notice it says I'm getting things done. So this top is where I changed it. So if I go back to here and I delete this and I just save it, the changes come up instantly. So yes. So that is actually the core of this discussion is getting, using these environments to um, segment your development so you can do more without having to make so many changes. So um, that actually is a good ending for the talk, but I have more. So 
let's, let's keep on going. So you look at this command line, docker run dash v, um, current working directory, and colon app to do, dash p 3000, colon 3000, dash link, come on. Um, you know, the, um, the, the very smart developer would write a script to do this, but Docker actually bought a company last year called Fig um, that makes this configuration for building these types of things. You should not have to remember, you know, that's a lot of characters. You should not remember that. Um, I'm actually quite impressed with myself remembering it and typing it for you guys, but I don't like to remember these types of things. So the next tool, let's go back to my slides again. Yeah, we went through that. These slides are just for, um, for so I remember where I am. They're not really for anything else. Um, so automating Docker. So there is a tool called Docker Compose. It used to be called Fig, but uh, Docker bought them, and Docker Compose sounds better than Fig. And what it allows you to do is create a YAML configuration file that allows you to describe this command line that we just created. So what does that look like? So we'll go look up our Docker Compose here, and it's, it's really simple. Um, it's already what we have. We have a database, and if you can read it from top to bottom, we have a database, the image is Postgres, and we want to use 941. The ports, we want, to, we want to take port 5432 and expose this as 5432. And then we want to have a web container. So notice the, the highest configuration, the highest key is an actual container. And then we want to have web. But instead of specifying an image, if we actually, we actually could put an image here if we had one, but we're not going to do that. We're going to build it locally. And then we're going to run the same command. This is the same command that we use on the command line. And we're going to expose port 3000 as 3000. We're going to say that it links to the database container that we just specified up here, and then we're just going to set this as our volumes. So this is everything that we specified in our, on our command line, but we've actually put it, we codified it in a file and made it deterministic. We can do this every single time and it should work. So what does that look like? I'm going to show you, but I'm going to kill everything we have right now. So I'm just going to go docker kill db. We don't need this anymore because we're not going to use it. Um, and all we're going to do is, um, I guess I haven't got tired of typing Docker Compose yet, because um, I haven't made a shorter one of it. But you can't have DC. What does DC do on the command line on most Unixes? Does anyone know? It's a calculator. So you can't get rid of that. That's, that's sacrilegious. So we will, we will type Docker Compose out. I'm thinking about typing it as comp, just aliasing it to comp, but I'm not there yet. And all we need to do is, because we use the file name, the convention is if you call it docker-compose, dot yaml, uh, let's see, if you, if you call it that, docker compose will use it by default. Docker compose gives you a couple of cool options. Um, you can build, so we can do, it's building our web, so whenever I did docker build earlier, it's doing that for me. Um, and all I need to do now is I can just go docker compose up, and I'll do dash d, because we really don't want to see this. Because it's going to basically start both apps, the to-do web app and the to-do database app. And it starts them up, and it manages them. I don't have to type anything else. And we can do docker compose ps. And we can see that we have two apps running. And that's from docker compose's view. Or we can do docker um, ps. And we can actually see the containers. And you notice that we don't have to worry about naming. It knows it uses the current directory name, and then the application name, and then the instance number. So once again, just to prove that we're still all working in the same place, mounted on port 3000, database is on port 5432, this is what we created earlier, we can delete it, um, just to show that this does actually work. And, and also, because we mounted the volume as this, if I were to go back to my application layout, um, and I were to change this in there to getting things done, and I want to say that we're happy now, no. Oh. There, and we're going to save this in Docker, and we save this, and we reload this page. Guess what? We're live editing. So I know I took a very long, this is, this is the demo that I wish someone would have gave me for Docker. Instead of saying, there's all these cool things, and you can do this, and you can do that, I wanted someone to walk me through something I would actually use in a way that I would actually use it. So what, are, like what I said before, what are the benefits of this? Benefits are, you can have multiple environments. You could actually set up another set of Docker containers. You could actually have another directory, and they would be totally separate. You could do this infinitely scalable 
I mean vertically. You could actually say, I want my own Redis, I want my own Mongo, I want my own Postgres, I want my own Rails apps. And guess what? You don't even have to do this at Ruby. You can say, I want this Go app, or this Perl app, or this, or that. And because I'm getting a little ahead of myself um, here, so we did Docker Compose, pretty sweet. We have an instant staging environment. Um, I think the, the holy grail for developers is getting a development environment that looks kind of like your staging environment, and hopefully your staging environment looks something like your production environment. If you use, when Docker matures, and it is maturing rapidly, and when Docker Compose matures, and Docker Machine matures, at that point, there is no excuse for having weird problems in production that aren't related to scale. Because guess what? You literally have, if you're running on Intel and your production is in an Intel, you're not running like ARM64 or something like that. It's all the same. And so because you have instant staging, you can say, what's next? Well, here's what's next. Um, so now, and this is actually, this is like, this is like um, I'm not going to show a lot of code for this or any code because it's crazy. But you can actually, you guys use CI. Who doesn't use CI? Yeah, it's 2015. No one does not use CI. It's crazy talk. That's like saying, I don't code with my keyboard. I actually just throw sticks and rocks at the keyboard and code comes out. No one does that. So um, whether you're using Jenkins or Travis, I hope you guys are using Travis. Support your locals, please. Um, or we use, dot, we use Drone internally. Don't use Drone. We don't like it. We're getting off of it. Don't use Drone. And Drone is built on Docker, which is kind of funny but we don't like it. So Jenkins or Travis or whatever else, or Circle CI or, or any of these new people coming out with um, CI tools, use those. And every single one of those tools has this thing at the end, the post task. So using the commands that I just showed you, if you put a Docker, if you put a, um, a Docker file in your directory as a post task, you could just say Docker build. So what's in production? Whatever I built in CI. Not whatever someone deployed or copied to CI, it's the exact thing that works. So now you can, def you can actually deploy, you deploy revisions or you can name them. You can say that this was this git sha one. And that's how you know it's exactly, you will know it exactly is in production at any time. And actually that's a hard, I mean we don't have that problem at all, but I know a lot of companies that have problems with knowing, well what's in production? Or did someone go into production to edit that file to fix that one thing? Well, no, we don't do that. We, we, we take it, we put it through CI, and hopefully our CI runs fast because CI that doesn't run fast is not useful. So our CI runs fast, it builds Docker containers, we take a Docker container and we deploy it. Well, how do we deploy it? This is an hour long talk in itself. Um, so Docker in production, scaling Docker, collecting the containers are the this is why I say that this is beta. Use it in staging, use it in development, but consider using it in production, but understand there may be demons. Um, there are a couple of things out right now. Um, Docker has Swarm. Um, they started talking about it in February at their, at their convention. And the cool thing about Docker Swarm is that it's getting support from a lot of bigger vendors. So basically Docker Swarm is a way to scale out, we don't need to see these, I should tell him I'm, Hold on here, sorry about that. Hopefully he doesn't say anything vulgar. Um, so Docker Swarm basically says, take this Docker configuration that I have working on my local machine or my staging environment and swarm it out, make it big. You can actually say Docker Swarm, scale this out to whatever. And there's good demos on the internet that are gonna be much more concise than, than what I have. They're going to tell you how to scale out with Swarm. And now Swarm, they said, we're not, just, we're not going to rest on our laurels. Has anyone here heard of Mesosphere? Mes Mesosphere. Yes. Mesosphere. Yep. It's M-E-S-O-P-H-E-R-E. -E. If you have not heard about it and you're using, and if you're thinking about any type of scale, whether it's a little bit of scale, you're trying to scale from one to three, or you're just trying to scale from one to 100,000, think about Mesosphere. And the cool thing about it is it's basically positioned as an operating system for your data center. Um, it's written by um, the same people who wrote um, Spark. Um, so people, you guys have heard of Spark, haven't you? It's like better than Hadoop, but still within that whole ecosystem. Um, these are basically um, out of um, California, Berkeley PhDs, who I guess had nothing else better to do but create awesome software. So Mesosphere allows you to say, Instead of saying, I want this server to run on this server, you basically say, 
Your servers say, I have 15 CPUs, I have 50 gigs of memory, I have 40 CPUs, because it's a really big server, and I have like two gigs of memory. I don't know how this works out. But um, and, instead, and now what you do is you say, whenever you want a new thing to run, your Docker, you say that my application typically only uses 300 megs of memory. So I'll just say, I want to run 50 of these, and I say, give me 50 instances of 500 megs with two, or one CPU, these are Rails apps. Can't, got that gill, so one, one CPU. But, and move it around. And I also want to say that this can't run in the same rack as five other ones. And Mesosphere will allow you to do that. And Mesosphere deploys Docker containers. And also, on the other side, there are other companies like Google who is spearheading Kubernetes with, um, and actually um, CoreOS, who we've spent a lot of work um, partnering with to actually boot them on our stack. They actually have this bigger Kubernetes tool that actually takes a different concept of saying, I want to describe my environment. I want to say that I need Redis here, and I want Rails apps over here, and I want database here. Um, and I want it to be this big. And you describe it in YAML, because Google's gonna, Google is like documentation king. Um, anything that you want to do at Google is going to be very verbose. And the configurations for Kubernetes are very verbose, but they're very good. And what they allow you to do is describe your environment with text. And you say, boot it. And it can use Docker containers as well. So what I'm trying to lay out here, and this is me summarizing, is that um, I've showed you with code and like no fakery, no, no slides to say this is how you could do it, no hand waviness. I booted a Rails app that I downloaded off the internet randomly in a Docker container. I showed you how to do it with Postgres. These same things will go for MySQL. They actually will work with Redis. Anything that speaks TCP, it would work. And then we took that and we were able to lie, we were able to um, modify it while it was in another machine and it works. Um, there are so many other topics that we could actually go down, like a lot of rabbit holes we could go down here because this ecosystem is huge. But I wanted to show you for real in live, this is what I wanted to see of someone do this on stage and you, now you can see it get done. Um, and I will leave with, um, we're committed to this. And actually I have a slide. I do have a slide. I was, I've been prompted to show this slide. Um, a couple weeks ago, CMO DigitalOcean um, I, I think I was on vacation. I was, I was in Puerto Rico on vacation. Um, and he sends me this message. We use Slack. And he says, he's like, he's right here, by the way. <laughs> um, this is Mitch and Carl. There's our CEO and CMO of DigitalOcean. Yes. And he says, on the last slide of your deck for your Ruby presentation in Germany, do you have a quick note that we just launched a data center and we have promo cards for those who want to experience low latency. Wink, wink. <laughs> um, and I want to tell Mitch, as he's sitting right here, yes, I do have that as my next to next to last slide, but I do have it. And we, I am very serious about this. Um, we really want you to experience DigitalOcean. Um, we do have promo cards, and I want to hear about your apps, whether I'll give you my card, you can tell me about it later, or you can tell me about it now, but we want to hear of why you, I want you, everyone to deploy your apps to DigitalOcean at least once, and I want to give you what you need to at least say, hey, that isn't a good idea, rather than you just thinking it, Cause, but it won't be, because I've never heard that before. <laughs> so, um, questions, comments? I know I give you a lot of stuff. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll take comments too. Yeah, great talk. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, it just took some time. So, what, what do you like? What's your estimate? When would you start using it in production? Or tomorrow? Okay. I'm saying you to evaluate it. Um, I've actually taken the last year, so like I typed a lot of things out, and you noticed that I was pretty quick with typing those things out. I've taken the time to understand Docker at a fundamental level. I understand how it works. I understand there are, I understand the nuances and the quirks, but I've been able to weigh that against um, whatever else we have. Um, we at DigitalOcean, we have a, not a very unique deployment problem, but we do have a large, like our scale is most likely bigger than your scale, unless you work at, there's a few companies that have larger scale than us. Um, taking that in consideration um, and evaluating all the pros, the pros and the cons, um, I am very, very bullish on Docker. Um, they did raise a bajillion dollars today, and um, 
It means that the community also agrees that Docker is the way, and the idea is still simple enough. I didn't do. I don't like the whole container ship thing. Like they have a great container ship analogy, but I've been hearing that for a year, and I don't want to hear that in talks anymore. I want to hear this is how you use it. Um, so I, I I challenge you to try it out in production. And there's a couple of ways you can do that on DigitalOcean. You can use Docker Machine and boot up a DigitalOcean drop it that way, or we have actually a very large set of curated one-click images on DigitalOcean, and we just happen to have a Docker one where you can just, you can log in, and you can create a droplet, you can choose the size, you can choose where it is, of course it's gonna be in Frankfurt, right? And then what you can do is, um, our, our, normal, our normal settings are, you know, CentOS, Ubuntu, Fedora, but there's a tab that's right next to it that says applications, I believe. And the applications, there's, a large list. I use them. I have a ghost blog and I just one click installed it and it actually works very well. But we have a Docker one as well. If you want to get your feet wet and you don't want to touch anything locally, you just want to see it running, try it. But I'm saying that anyone who wants to run it in production, try it. There are problems. You probably will run into problems like anything else. You will run into problems. I'm not here to tell you that it's the panacea, but it is much better than what we have right now. And um, the tools you talked about, like Swarm and so, so yeah. Docker Swarm, so I'll talk about them in the order. I talked about Docker Machine, Docker Compose, and Docker Swarm. Um, those are all maintained by Docker. Mesosphere is another com company, and their process, and their product is called Mesos. And that's a, it's a, it's a, it was solving a different problem, but can happen to use Docker as part of its solution. Oh, no, go ahead. Like, like, uh, let's say you um, have 10 instances of the same Rails um, uh, app. What would you normally use to load balance? Oh, OK. So. I don't know. For example, oh, no, I, I, will t I will tell you the answer. So yes, HAProxy is the answer. Uh, with Docker Swarm, you have the ability to inspect what actually is running something. So you can, you can infer. So this is how you would do it at anything. So I don't care how you would build this up, even if you're using Mesos or something else. Um, you can, inf as long as you can infer what is serving this content, you can build an HTTP proxy configuration in real time. So but also redeploy that. Mm -hmm. okay. Now there are some gotchas. There are dragons, and, and I didn't talk. And this is why I specifically said I'm not talking about production. Here's a problem: if you have an application instance here on host A, and you have ten hosts, so you have ten application instances. Where's your database? Maybe it's on host four. So the one on host four, the, the Rails app on host four can reach the database. What happens to all the rest of them? Because you notice that I only linked, I didn't link host names, I linked container names. Um, if you're taking notes, there's something called the Docker ambassador pattern. And what it allows you to do is say that on every host you would run a Docker ambassador. And you would say, it would say that I know that there's a, Rails, there's a, there's a Postgres something out there somewhere on the network and I know where it is but if someone asks me where it is I'm just going to tell you it's me. So um, it's called the ambassador pattern and it allows you to move things around the network. Um, Docker is working on other things. Um, there's a project called Weave. I don't think they work on it by themselves and actually I don't think Docker runs on it at all. There's a project called Weave and what it allows you to do is weave your network together so all your Docker containers can look like they're on one network segment and they can actually refer to each other by IP address. Um, there's another company called Rancher OS. They've actually been, they came to speak at one of our events last year and then just a few weeks ago they came to our office and their new stuff, specifically their networking is amazing. What they can do is you can have, you could actually have Docker containers in different disparate locations. You could have one in like our Frankfurt data center, one in our New York data center, and they would all look there on the same subnet. And the benefit of that is that it makes it easy. But they know that because these things might be going over the public internet, it's all, it's basically just huge encrypted networks, it's all IPsec. And so basically you could talk to something and after, after it figures out where it is on the network, it's, um, the only, only latency is the tiny little bit of encryption which is taken care of by your CPU anyways, and the distance. So what, what are we, like a, you're like a 30 second, 30 millisecond ping time from New York from here, so you could actually run them both, you could. Um, but look at products like that. The ecosystem is vibrant. Like all the problems you're having, um, they're solving them. And actually, if you want to look at open source stewardship 
Um, look at Docker's repos. I've never seen pull requests with um, commentary. And people come in there with this much text. I will not read any of it. I'll read like the first sentence. But I'm impressed that people are reading or writing this much stuff. And they discuss things. And they have RFCs. It's, it's actually it's pretty encouraging for an open source company. So any problem you've had, someone's already had it. And there, if there isn't a solution, someone is working on it. Hey, go ahead. My last question. Mm -hmm. It's really not. I don't want to troll anything, but uh, this is all IP for four. Oh. So. So. Is there, so I don't know what how many are left or anything. <laughs> so so um so so here's the thing. Um, I can't speak of Docker and IPv6. I think there is fledgling support if there's not full support. But I will say this for DigitalOcean, besides three data centers, and we're going to fix this very soon, um, we are every, every region supports Yes, IPv6. that's an even better way of saying it. Every region that we have supports IPv6. So we're IPv6 all throughout the world. It's still a real, for me at least, but yeah. It'll be real here this week. It's coming. <laughs> Anyone else have five questions? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. All right, well, I guess we can shut this down. And thank you once again.